hi everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm sorry uh, for the setup today because um, the problem is uh, that I, my flight today yesterday was cancelled back home to Germany, and uh, yeah, I don't have any laptop or something like that with me. But um, yeah, I still want to do the session, and um, yeah, therefore, uh, yeah, I had to find a, a replacement laptop and all the stuff, but. Um, the good thing is I have mo most of um, the material I want to show you today uh, online um, in an online workshop and I can show that to you now. Um, and what we'll do in the rest of the session is really talk about um, how you can uh, go serverless um, using uh, the Spring Framework ecosystem. And um, for that, the first thing I want to do is um, introduce to, do, uh, to you the um, you know, what serverless is at the end that we have a common understanding of it. And then I will show you how you can um, use uh, the Spring Framework ecosystem to um, um, yeah, improve um, the, your current applications uh, to get the best out of the serverless platform. And um, let's now directly begin um, on uh, what serverless is. So uh, serverless, um, it doesn't mean that there is no service. It just means uh, that you don't have to care about that. And um, yeah, you can group serverless into two areas. The first one is backend as a service, um, which is really about replacing server-side self-managed components with uh, of the search shelf services. Examples for that um, are, for example, um, authentication services like Okta or, 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 or Zero, but you don't have to care about that authentication server and all the stuff. It's managed for you. You just consume it, consume it from your applications. And, um, the other group is function as a service. It's a new way of building applications um, around functions. So um, yeah, at the end, uh, um, instead of having one monolithic application, having individual functions that are focused on uh, something special. And um, usually um, because you have those tiny functions that are specialized in something, um, and they drive a new architecture. So a, um, a type of architecture, a venture of my architecture, and um, yeah, you also then need, uh, not only need the, your functions, you only, only also need something um, that supports, um, for example, and the orchestration of those, et cetera. And uh, the key um, for both is, um, so both, both groups is um, that um, you can really focus on business value. So that's important because um, um, whether, for example, all the stuff you're doing on the infrastructure side, um, or getting your functions connected to uh, a message queue, for example, that's not how you um, provide any business value. And therefore, you should always uh, use an abstraction or the highest abstraction available to you. Let's now have a look at uh, the characteristics of serverless. Um, a serverless service, so the first thing we already discussed is um, that it doesn't require um, to manage a long-lived living host um, or application instance. So it's not like in um, those um, yeah, traditional monolithic applications that run in one VM all the time. Um, a serverless is all about that you have long living instances of application and several instances running in parallel, also for example, for high availability. And uh, then also those auto scaling capabilities um, 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 of a serverless platform with which you can uh, you are able to to handle um, the demand. So so if you don't um, have uh, uh, the same demand all the time, um, you can scale your application up and down, and will that also save a lot of money? And um, also, um, and the costs are usually then um, based on the precise usage instead of um, that you have to provision upfront, for example, five instances of your, of your application to serve the maximum amount of uh, demand or traffic. And, um, so this leads us to the why of serverless. Um, so one benefit of serverless really is that higher abstraction and the shorter lead time you have um, um, to deploy your applications. Second one is the, the flexibility of scaling, as I already mentioned regarding, um, yeah, if you have, for example, let's say, or you see that usually if um, there's um, something new coming up, for example, the latest iPhone, um, at the end, even, even Apple had problems to scale there. It looked like uh, um, uh, their, their infrastructure for the credit card payments. 
and therefore all the people were not really able to successfully um, buy their iPhone. That's typical a problem of um, um, that a downstream system was not able to scale enough. Um, another benefit of the auto scaling is also uh, to reduce the costs of your resources because uh, then you can, um, um, if you don't have to uh, scale upfront, you can uh, consume your resources um, with your specific or yeah, from other applications if they are not used or researched by another application um, before that demand, for example. And also for sure, um, a lot of uh, labor costs um, because of the fact you don't need the people that, for example, um, manage the hosts of your servers, etc. If you're use, if you're using um, a SaaS service, for example, for authentication. And last but not least, also the risk. So if you're not managing all the stuff yourself, instead of uh, another company um, manage it, you don't have the risk of the solution itself, for sure, if, if you have the risk that uh, maybe the SaaS solution uh, is going, um, you know, can, can have outages, but at the end, like you don't have the risk of the application, et cetera, itself. Um, and um, yeah, serverless doesn't only have um, uh, pros, it also has cons or drawbacks. And one of them you maybe already have seen in, uh, on Twitter, for example, are the unpredictable costs. So um, for sure, you're able to, to um, in a way, configure the maximum um, amount um, of scaling, et cetera. But if you forget it, it could be that you get really high bills, um, for example, with AWS Lambda. So um, yeah, you have to, in a way, control that. Um, another problem, which we will try to mitigate today with uh, uh, some technology, is that it takes time to spin up new machines or uh, instances of your application. And um, the applications that consume your applications, um, they have to handle those uh, timeouts. So that's important. And uh, for example, retry it, et cetera. And um, another thing, so, so every stateless application is, uh, a serverless application is more or less stateless because um, of the fact that you need that, um, yeah, high availability or also the scaling, you need a lot of instances running in parallel. But, uh, and therefore they are not able to to um, to save it. the state on the file system, for example. So you have to um, stay uh, save the state in the database. And um, therefore um, you're also adding, for example, a lot of latency um, for the communication between uh, your services and then the database. Um, and um, yeah, they are more like, for example, also um, the loss of control. If you have SaaS services, serverless components, um, you more or less have to trust uh, uh, the vendor of that solution. Um, and also um, then you're not able to really, you're with your money able to influence in which direction the solution goes, but you have more or less uh, to trust them. And another problem also with the serverless, um, with most of the serverless solutions um, that are available as of right now, um, if they don't follow a specific standard, um, is the vendor lock in your half. And um, for our example here, um, we are using a serverless runtime called Knative, which is available as open source. And with that, therefore, you don't have uh, the vendor lock in, as with, for example, AWS Lambda. And um, so what is Knative? Knative is a serverless runtime on top of Kubernetes. Um, so it provides um, those serverless capabilities where the auto scaling, for example, um, and that higher abstraction that you say, okay, here's my container image, and then you got a URL um, where you can just call your application back um, on top of Kubernetes. And that component that provides functionally is called uh, Knative Serving. There's another component part of Knative called Knative Eventing, which is um, uh, um, a, a, a technology that enables developers to um, uh, build event-driven architectures. So it's really about that uh, um, consuming events and uh, forwarding them to uh, applications, um, whether then, for example, event sources and uh, consumers and an abstraction to uh, um, those messaging solutions like, for example, RabbitMQ or Kafka. Today, we will focus on the Knative serving so that serverless runtime. 
And um, in summary, so why should you um, um, uh, um, go serverless with your Spring application? Um, the first thing is uh, developer productivity, and that's a really important topic in general. So um, if you're um, um, developers or you as a developer, if you spend too much time on the infrastructure, getting your application running and stuff like that, that's usually a sign that um, you have a, a developer experience gap. And, um, because um, if you are at new functionalities, that's the only way how your business um, gets value out of you. Um, that's something where you should, for example, um, uh, um, ask your IT uh, for a better abstraction on top of Kubernetes that you don't have to care about container images, for example, and how your application runs on Kubernetes, still in high abstraction. And this is where serverless runtime helps, for example, then platform elasticity. So really about that, okay, if there is um, not that um, yeah, one uh, or the same demand all the time where you can just provision three instances and they are able to handle it. So if you have some peaks, um, that's also um, a really great use case for serverless runtime without scaling capabilities and scale to zero, then also to reduce a lot of costs. And um, yeah, so um, what we want to do now is um, try out um, really basic Spring application on top of a serverless runtime, so Knative, and um, see how it behaves. And for that, we will go um, to the terminal here um, I have to refresh it one time. And um, then just jump to the example. And um, the first thing we usually have to do with our Spring application is um, to, because as, as I said, the so Knative is a serverless runtime on Kubernetes and what it provides more or less is in addition to the auto scaling, the story like here's a container image and, and then you got a URL back where you can call your application. And um, for that um, Spring, as you can see here, provides um, out of the box where, uh, from version 2.3, um, upwards a uh, support for so-called cloud native build packs, um, which automatically build a container image um, out of your Spring application, and then you can push it uh, to a registry um, for um, yeah use by, for example, Kubernetes or Docker. And this is what we will uh, um, do now. So um, running that Maven um, a Spring Boot build image command. Um, with a tag, so under which we will um, then want to, to store and access our container image. And um, that will take some seconds. And what the Cloud Native Bullpack does, does, so it's using um, the uh, out of the box, the Paketo open source build pack. So they are open source by VMware. Um, and, and that standard was built together by Pivotal and Heroku. Um, Pivotal was acquired by VMware and therefore, um, yeah, technologies like, for example, also Spring. So with the acquisition of Pivotal, VMware is the vendor of Spring. And I also, um, it came with the acquisition of Pivotal to VMware. And um, what the cloud native build packs do is uh, um, they detect um, based on, for example, files. So in this case, there is a POM XML, um, but for sure it's Spring Boot, so it knows, okay, it's usually then uh, uh, Maven or um, Gradle and it's a Spring application. But also if you use them uh, with a so-called PEC CLI, it will detect then, okay, there's a POM XML and therefore it knows, oh, okay, so I need the Maven um, uh, Cloud Native Build Pack to build the application. And then I need um, a build pack for the JVM um, to provide the runtime for it. Um, and um, then for sure also the operating system will be uh, um, also bundled in the container image. So it's really like detecting which of the different um, build packs um, they can provide something to the container image and then those will be um, executed and um, build the container image as you can see here. And um, now we have our container image um, available on our, um, on our uh, machine here. As you can see, so that's the little container image. And um, then the next thing we want to do is because we want to consume it from Kubernetes, 
is we push it to our container registry, which will take some seconds. And um, yeah, now we have our container image. And uh, the next thing is we want to um, run it on our service runtime. And um, I said, our service runtime here is Knative, which is installed in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, um, to interact with Knative, so it's Kubernetes native. So all those custom resource definitions, you could just um, write them together and apply it via kubectl apply. But it also provides as a higher abstraction, a CLI called a C uh, KM. And then you can run KM service create with a name on the application, the container image. And in this case, I um, configure auto scaling to minimum of one instances because by default it's uh, scaled to zero. For sure, you can um, configure a lot of more stuff, but for that easy example, it really shows the value of, of Knative. So as you can see, I just executed, and now it will wait until um, the URL is uh, available to call our application. And, um, that's now you can see here is the URL. I can just call it via curl and it worked. And um, let's now have a look at, um, for example, the startup time of that application, because as we saw, it's important. Um, once I, um, so, so because of, of, of cost reductions, because as fast as I can scale up, as fast as I can also scale them uh, down or um, yeah, add new instances and remove you. And also, um, so I don't have to provision something beforehand, um, the requests are coming. On the other side, it's also like, um, uh, if I um, start, my application starts faster, um, I don't, uh, I, I will not run that often into timeout problems where the consuming applications. And um, if I now have a look at the logs, I can see that my application started in five, around five seconds. And uh, yeah, so um, please remember uh, the five seconds because we will later see um, how it performs on a serverless runtime. Um, if we have a look at uh, the running pods, you can see currently, because I set the minimum to one instance, we have one pod run. And um, if we use a, a tool like Hey uh, to um, execute a lot of requests against our application, we can now see how it scales up. So if I just move that a little bit to the top, you can now see that automatically um, additional pods will be started because of all the requests that Hey command executes. And I have to cancel it because it's, um, as you can see, 20, uh, 26,000 responses. So it executes a lot of requests uh, towards the application. But you can also see that all those, um, all those uh, pods I now have that they started or they are starting because of the five seconds, it takes some time and then they will also scale down. Um, so they saw that auto scaling and for sure if we have better startup times, then we have better auto scaling at the end and faster auto scaling and uh, not that much of the commands uh, time out. Um, if we have a look at the resource consumption, we can see that, I just have to move my window a little bit. Um, we can see um, that uh, the application, so the user container, that's the one where the application is and um, that, um, yeah, they consume around, um, uh, uh, two to uh, CPU um, processors and uh, around 250 megabytes. So we will also later see um, then how maybe we can improve that. And um, yeah, to improve that, uh, let's um, uh, um, now have a look. Um, yeah, what technologies are available to do that? And um, to get the full potential out of uh, out of um, our service application, we have to improve the startup time as mentioned for the time also, and also to, to really um, serve the traffic and don't have to scale up front. Um, it's also beneficial to lower the resource consumption because at the end, it's like if you have thousands of containers or instances running to serve a uh, demand um, that costs you a lot of money. And, um, um, for that, um, we will now have a look. So I will maybe um, go back to the slides here. Um, um, at um, yeah, how a typical um, Java application is um, 
compiled and um, yeah, uh, run at the end. And uh, um, those applications, so typically, um, if you run them on a JVM, they will be um, uh, compiled to bytecode and then packaged in a jar file, for example, or in a var file. And um, that bytecode will be then interpreted um, by a bytecode interpreter um, um, in the, uh, if it runs on the JVM. For sure, one benefit of that is uh, the portability. So you can run the same application on any operating system. Um, the downside of that um, uh, um, bytecode um, interpreter is uh, that it's um, yeah, always slower than executing the same application um, natively uh, or in machine language, um, um, in language of the um, yeah, machine where you're running it. And um, for that, um, there's a solution called the just-in-time compiler, which um, compiles um, 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 your application or the bytecode to a native uh, to native language um, for those paths paths um, that um, are executed frequently in your application. Um, and with that, you got um, um, a really good performance. Um, but the downside is, is that it, that uh, just in time compilation increases the startup time and also consumes um, resources. So one of the yeah uh, things that we could improve uh, uh, in our application on a serverless runtime. Um, but um, yeah, there's also a head of time compilation, and with a head of time compilation, the idea is to really compile every of the different paths of your application um, down to um, native uh, language, machine language and uh, create a native executable, which you then can run um, on uh, the same um, operating system uh, um, without a JVM or something like that. And um, the benefit that is that uh, it starts really fast um, also, the resource uh, con consumption is lower. Um, the problem is um, that it's first bound to the, that specific um, uh, machine, machine type you compile it for. And um, also that um, that process of the compilation takes a lot of time. And um, But that's something, so it improves the startup time and the resource consumption. So at the end, what we are looking for. and. Um, um, the, the native executable, so so we call it a native image, and um, uh, that's really what we want to um, what we want to uh, do with our application now. So try to compile it to a native image for the benefit of faster startup times and um, also lower re resource consumption. The technology we are using here, so um, and it's something in the Java world, something I would say new, or um, yeah, there are not many solutions available. So um, the solution that's available now, um, and also is co compared to to how long it is there, also in a way major is CraalVM um, uh, as a high performance JDK distribution by Oracle, and um, the idea is really to have um, one um, a virtual machine that can execute um, every Java application, every other JVM application, and also um, popular other uh, languages um, that are usually not running on the JVM. You know, for example, JavaScript, Ruby, or Python. And um, it has a three runtime modes. So the first one is uh, JVM. So the one you know from the JDK. Um, then um, it also uh, has um, the Java, J Java on Truffle um, uh, um, runtime mode, which is um, uh, provides an abstraction to run um, um, also JavaScript, Ruby, and Python, so non VM JV, um, JVM languages on it. And then, um, last but not least, and the one we are interested in, um, it also provides the runtime mode uh, for uh, native images so that we can compile our application to a native image. Um, there's also, uh, um, in the future, there will be also other um, um, distributions that support native images. For example, um, 
and Project Laden is uh, something from, from OpenJDK where they are working on. But um, as I said, so as of right now, Graalvium is more or less the go to um, a distribution for native images. And um, as I said, so it's not like that everything is great. The same with a serverless. So it's also like you really have to see whether your application um, is a use case for serverless. Um, so if you always have uh, the same demand, it doesn't really make sense to, to have serverless here because then you can scale up front, um, for example. And the same is it with native images. So it doesn't make sense to just compile everything to a native image um, because of the downsides. And um, one of the big downsides um, that will most probably never fully mitigate it is the build time. So we will see that later it takes uh, several minutes to build um, the application to a native image. Um, other uh, downsides compared to JVM, like for example, the latency and throughput um, of, of um, yeah, the, your application at the end and uh, the maturity, those are things um, yeah, that are currently uh, worked on to mitigate those, but as at the build time because of that full static analysis of your, of your source code that will uh, yeah, also in the future uh, be a um, problem um, uh, with uh, native images. Um, so just that you heard that, so usually the recommendation if you want to get um, the benefits out of a native image is uh, that for your development on your local machine and um, that you um, compile your application um, for the JVM and try it out on the JVM. And then you have um, as, as, um, a CI CD pipeline that builds a native image for you so that you don't have to wait for it, but for sure it could be that there are some problems that are only in the uh, native image and not in the JVM image and um, yeah, or, or JAR file, and then you also have to compile it. Um, what's important about a native image is, as I said, so it's a static analysis of your source code. Uh, and one problem for sure is then it needs more or less to compile or execute all the parts of your application. Um, and, um, What's not possible at the end for technology is that it, it's not possible for it that it knows um, every execution path if, you, you're, if you're using dynamic features. For example, uh, lazy cl uh, class loading, reflection, dynamic proxies, etc. And therefore, it's not possible without additional configuration that um, uh, your application then, um, yeah, is. is successfully, so it will successfully compile. But if you then execute your code um, using that, uh, those dynamic features, it will fail. And uh, you have to provide a configuration via configuration files, but there's also support via, for example, an agent um, library where you then execute your, the JVM. Um, so via the JVM, you execute uh, then those uh, paths and paths in your application and um, then it will generate the configuration for you and then you can compile it um, to, um, to the native image. And um, yeah, let's now have a look at, um, before we continue by, uh, with Spring, let's now continue, uh, have a look at um, how um, we can build an application with a, to a native image. And, um, If we, for example, have a look at a really basic example here, so it's just a Hello World uh, Java application, so nothing Spring related, um, and open it in our editor. You can see, okay, it's just system out print law, and um, with uh, the JVM, it's like, okay, within seconds, um, we, we have, have it compiled. Um, and then, um, if we build the native image, it, likes, it, it takes a lot of uh, long, a long, a lot longer um, via the um, native image library here. So, um, with that executable, we are able to build out of the compiled source code um, a hello world, um, our hello world native uh, image executable for um, the architecture you can see here. And um, yeah, I said for that simple example, that will take one and a half minutes to compile that. 
um, then you can assume how long it takes if you have yeah, uh, a full application to build it. So it takes several minutes and it consumes also a lot of memory. Um, and therefore it really makes sense to do that in a CI CD pipeline and not on your local computer. As long as that's running, we will have a look at um, the limitations I already mentioned. So those dynamic features that cannot be detected by um, static analysis. And um, so Java reflection, Java uh, JNI calls dynamic proxy objects, for example. And um, I have some of the examples here. So if you go to my GitHub account, um, you can also have a look at all of them and try them out yourself so because of the time. And uh, yeah, the problem I had <laughs> with the getting a replacement laptop, um, uh, we're, uh, we don't have that much time today, but um, if we, for example, have a look at the reflection, you can see um, what's happening here is uh, that I have um, the reflection here, so class for name, etc. And um, the class name is an argument that's coming um, and the method name as it's coming uh, um, as an argument and therefore for sure a static analysis doesn't know which class you want to call and method. And um, therefore we have to create um, that uh, configuration file and for this, that that I already mentioned there is um, a tool um, called agentlib which you can um, see here, Java agent lib native image. And then what you do is um, you execute um, your application with the arguments that you want to do them in production, for example, and it will generate a configuration. We'll see that in a second after our application is built here. So you can see it worked as a native image. Um, and um, yeah, it took us one minute and 40 seconds to um, compile a, a Hello World application to a native image. You can also see here, okay, three gigabyte um, of RAM, for example. And, um, but it worked, which is great. If we now have a look at um, uh, this, uh, so, so the dynamic features that you saw at, at the end, it's like, um, what I do with that agent lib is I run, I run it. Um, let's just retry it. I think I have to. <laughs> um, I'm not in the right. One second. I think I'm not in the right folder here. So, okay. So this is how it looks like on the JVM. And if I now go back to my agent lib and execute it. You see, okay, it's the same output because it just ran um, uh, the same, with the same arguments, um, the, the open JDK, but with a, a agent lib. And then if we go to the generated source file, you can see how a configuration file for the reflection, for example, looks like. So um, what it does, it says, okay, that's uh, the name of the class and that's the method. Um, that will be used by dynamic features and therefore it will be also compiled or packed in the native image. Um, and this is how we do that more or less for every of the dynamic features. And if you're consuming, for example, on the spring um, uh, dependency that already um, is compatible with the uh, uh, native images, then it will already provide all the configuration for you. If it's not the case, um, then you can add that manually to your application for the dependencies, it's just as your information. And um, after I have the configuration, I would then normally just run my native image compilation uh, uh, with, a, with a binary and then um, it would work because of that additional configuration. And the fact that it will pack uh, in um, those classes. Um, same for assessing resources. For assessing resources, there's also like in addition to the agent lib, um, there's also uh, um, um, there's also uh, for the native image, there's also a flag where you can reference those, so you don't have to use the agent lib to configure it. 
Um, and then for class initialization, initialization, it's the same. You can define which of the classes you want to um, initialize at runtime and at build time um, uh, to um, yeah, mitigate those challenges, but you have to aware it's not possible to, um, or it doesn't make sense to, um, for example, have everything which is the default at runtime um, or at build time. Okay, so for that. Because of the time, we will jump over that, but as that, so it's in my Git repository, so you can have a closer look. And um, what we um, talked about now is, okay, how can I compile a Java application to a native image? But as you know, um, so we are here, uh, or the title is going serverless using a Spring framework ecosystem. And um, uh, Spring um, added incubation support for um, compiling Spring applications to uh, native images. Um, using Gravium uh, with a Spring Native library, um, which um, yeah, you can all already use uh, for production use if you want to. Um, it will be fully uh, supported with a Spring Boot 3, um, uh, which will, I think, be released uh, yeah, at the end of the year. So something around November, December was probably at spring one. And um, you know, what it does, at, so it, it comes with all the tools for you to, to really build um, your, uh, <clears throat> to build your spring applications to uh, Gravium native images. So as you can see here, because it's, um, um, <clears throat> it's, it's still an incubation support, I added that library for a spring native um, to my POM XML, I said with Spring Boot, um, um, <clears throat> with Spring Boot uh, 3 that will be completely um, then embedded and you can decide which um, runtime mode um, uh, you want to have. So the Spring Native library, if you go to start at spring.io, you can just type it and then it will be added in the latest version and um, with everything set up. So also that uh, Maven uh, plugin you need for it. So um, the ahead of time Maven plugin, that is the one that um, will also then help you uh, to um, uh, generate um, um, the configuration for you. And um, yeah, so what we will do now is um, we will run um, package our application. So with the Maven uh, P native, if you have that uh, plugin, we can um, just via that profile native uh, package our application to a native image on our computer. But um, in this case, we want to run on serverless runtime. Um, what we will do is um, we will uh, build a container image out of it. We can do that also with the build image command uh, and P native but um, because it takes a little, it consumes a little bit more resources, we will use a solution called KPAC, which um, creates the container image where the um, cloud native build packs in the Kubernetes cluster for us instead of our local machine. This will take um, uh, probably also yeah, two minutes, something like that to build it. Um, if it works, um, I think I just, the CD didn't work. Looks better now. Okay, so I already have that image, which is good because of the time. And, um, but we can uh, have a look at it. Um, here's our image. Um, so, um, because of the error, we have to delete it. Always a problem if you're not working on your computer. Sorry. <laughs> Uh. 
So this will now build our application in the background. Um, and until this is um, executing, um, I will just talk a second about, okay, those limitations we saw before about the, those dynamic features, for, for sure they are also, um, uh, they are also a problem for Spring. And, um, but for Spring, um, what it uh, provides is um, so-called native hint, hints um, with which you're able to then annotate your source code um, and uh, provide the and, and the proper configuration will then be generated. So like for example, in this example here, if we go to it for the reflection, we can see that there is a type hint. So the same example we ran, a type hint, um, um, regarding that um, spring, uh, string um, reverser class and um, all that I want to, to provide all um, or have all declared methods in my, my native image. And with that, it's like you don't have to go to the, you still can go to the, to the route of configuring everything through uh, those files, also run um, the agent lib manually, but um, with that, you're able to use annotations to uh, mitigate, um, yeah, those uh, restrictions regarding um, uh, your dynamic features. You can see, so there's also like, um, in addition to the type in, so for more or less every, every dynamic feature, there is its own, um, uh, its own annotation, like for example here, also for the resources. If it's opening. Mm. Hello, Timo. We have to come to an end, like two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, hopefully, then I, I, I uh, that uh, image will be built, and I can just show it. Um. So as you can see, it's still, still building. And um, yeah, if you are not able to see it, uh, uh, hopefully we, we will. Um, it's really like, so in that five minutes we had before with that native image, so just compiling it. And because I don't use any native image, uh, uh, dynamic features here, it's just compiling it to a native image and yeah, waiting for all the build time. Um, uh, the, the startup time will go down to from five seconds to 100 milliseconds. And um, the resource and consumption will be also um, uh, down from, I think we saw something around 250 megabyte to uh, 60 megabyte. So it's really like, it um, gives you and those uh, yeah, resource re reductions we want to have for our, for our service application to at the end save costs and also uh, don't run that often uh, into um, timeouts. Um, and with that, um, yeah, we have a solution for this that at the end to run our, to run our Spring applications on serverless. And as said, with Spring Boot 3, we will come out uh, um, in the next few months. Um, that support is out of the box available. Otherwise, you can um, already use that Spring native library. Um, and how to integrate it, the easiest way to see that is just to go to start at spring.io and add it there.
and we can maybe if there's some questions already start with the questions and then see whether it's um, yeah finishes here and um, well we can see how it behaves. Thank you.